Hello everybody, my name is Iman. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're covering the last chapter for our MCAT Biochem playlist. This chapter is about non-enzymatic protein functions and protein analysis. Now, typical functions provided by proteins within the cell include things like supporting cellular shape and organization and acting as enzymes. Now, previously we've talked about enzymatic functions of proteins, but we haven't focused too much on structural proteins or motor proteins or binding proteins. And that's kind of one of the things that we want to start talking about in this chapter. So we're going to start with first covering structural proteins. Now, the primary structural proteins in the body are things like collagen, elastin, keratin, actin, and tubulin. Structural proteins generally have a very highly repetitive secondary structure and a super secondary structure, which is just a repetitive organization of secondary structural elements together that are referred to as a motive. And this kind of regularity, it really gives many structural proteins a fibrous nature. So what we want to do is we just want to talk about a couple of these examples of structural proteins. Ultimately, um, these kinds of proteins are going to be proteins that play a role that in like composing the skeleton, uh, cytoskeleton and anchoring proteins and much of that extracellular matrix. Collagen has a characteristic trihelical fiber um, and it makes up most of the extracellular matrix of connective tissue. It's really found throughout the body and it's important in providing things like strength and flexibility. Elastin is another important component of the extracellular matrix of connective tissue. Its primary role is to stretch and then recoil like a spring, which restores the original shape of the tissue. Keratins are actually intermediate filament proteins that will be found in epithelial cells. They contribute to the mechanical integrity of the cell and they also function as regulatory proteins. Keratin is the primary protein that will make up hair and that makes up hair and nails. Then we have actin. Actin is a protein that makes up microfilaments and the thin filaments in myofibrils. It's actually one of the most abundant protein in eukaryotic cells. Actin proteins, um, they have a positive and a negative side and this polarity actually allows motor proteins to travel unidirectional along an actin filament, kind of like just a one-way street. And then last but not least, in regards to structural proteins you should be familiar with is tubulin. Tubulin is a protein that makes up microtubules, and microtubules are really important for providing structure, for chromosome separation in mitosis and meiosis, and intracellular transport within um, kinesin and dynein, which are going to be motor proteins we talk about here in, in just a second. Um, like actin, tubulin also has polarity, um, and the negative end of a microtubule is, uh, is usually located near or adjacent to the nucleus, whereas the positive end is usually in the periphery of a cell. So that is structural proteins. What about motor proteins? Now, some structural proteins also have motor functions in the presence of motor proteins, right? The, the, the um, cilia and flagella of bacteria and, and sperm are prime examples of this, right? Because the contraction um, are prime examples of this because motor proteins actually also display enzymatic activity and they aid in the, in, in the movement of structural proteins. Now, um, like we said, motor proteins, they display also enzymatic activity acting on ATPases that power the conformational change necessary for motor function. And they are, they have transient interactions with things like actin or micro or microtubules. Now, myosin is the primary motor protein that interacts with actin. Um, in addition to its role as the thick filament in a myofibril, myosin can also be involved in things like cellular transport. 
Each myosin subunit will have a single head and neck, and movement at the neck is going to be um, responsible for the power stroke of a, a, a sarcomere contraction. Now, um, kinesines and dynines, written right here, they are motor proteins that are generally associated with microtubules. So myosin with actin and these guys with microtubules. And we said that tubulin is the protein that makes up microtubules, by the way. All right. Now, these two are, uh, these two are motor proteins that are associated with microtubules. They have two heads, at least uh, one of which remains attached to tubulin at all times. Kinesins, they play a role in aligning chromosomes during metaphase and depolymerizing microtubules during anaphase of mitosis. Dienes are involved in the sliding movement of cilia and flagella. Both proteins are really important for vesicle transport in the cell. The thing is that they have opposite polarity. So kinesines, they bring vesicles toward the positive end of microtubules, and dienes, they bring vesicles towards the negative end. Um, in neurons, we can neurons are a good classic example of, of the, the consequences of these motor proteins polarities, right? Because kinesines will bring vesicles of neurotransmitters to the positive end of an axonal microtubule, so like towards the synaptic terminal, whereas in contrast, dynines will bring vesicles of waste or recycled neurotrans neurotransmitters back towards that negative end of the microtubule, toward the soma, right? And so that's a really clear depiction of, of, of some of the consequences of the polarity, um, um, the different opposite polarities of dynines and, and kinesines. So in general, as a short, all right, that's motor proteins. They're responsible for muscle contraction and cellular movement. Fantastic. Then we also have binding proteins. Like, well, well, well pro proteins, they primarily exert enzymatic or structural functions within the cell, they can also have, you know, some stabilizing functions in individual cells in the body. Proteins that act in this way will tend to uh, transport or sequester molecules by binding to them. And binding proteins, including hemoglobin or calcium binding proteins or DNA binding proteins and others, um, they will act as some mean of, of, of transport or, or, or sequestering molecules through that binding. Now, each binding protein will have an affinity curve for its molecule of interest. Um, a transport protein, which has to be able to bind or unbind to its target to maintain steady state concentration, that's likely to have varying affinity depending on environmental conditions, obviously. All right, so that's binding proteins for us. What about cell adhesion molecules? Cell adhesion molecules, also known as CAMs for short, are proteins that are found on the surface of most cells, and they aid in binding the cell to the extracellular matrix or to other cells. Now, while there are several different types of CAMs, they are all essentially integral membrane proteins. Adhesion molecules, they can be classified ultimately into three classes three major families or classes, all right? Those are cadherins, integrins, and selectins. Now we're gonna just quickly, briefly describe what each of these are. Cadherins are a group of glycoproteins that will mediate calcium-dependent cell adhesion, all right? They're often, they often hold similar cell types together, like epithelial cells, um, and different cells usually will have type-specific cadherins, for example, Epithelial cells will use E cadherin, while nerve cells are going to have, you know, their type specific cadherins, which are called N cadherin. All right, so that's cadherins. Integrins are a group of proteins that are going to have two membrane spanning chains called alpha and beta. Um, and these chains are really important in binding to and communicating with the extracellular matrix. Now, integrins also play a really important role in cellular signaling. They can also greatly impact cellular function by promoting cell division, apoptosis, or even other processes. Selectins, 
So lectins are unique because they bind to carbohydrate molecules that project from other cell surfaces. These are, bonds are the weakest uh, formed by, the, by, by CAMs. Um, they're expressed on white blood cells and the endothelial cells that line plant, blood vessels. And like integrins, they also play a very important role in host defense, including inflammation and white blood cell migration. All right. Now, in terms of maybe a little bit of a real world application, many medications, they'll target selectins and integrins. So, for example, research has shown that the, the ability of cancer cells to uh, metastasize or, again, break away from a tumor and then invade other distant tissues is associated with unique expression patterns of these cell adhesion molecules. And then by targeting them, by targeting these cell adhesion molecules, metast uh, metastasis may be avoided. Um, and then even to stop um, the clotting process maybe during heart attacks, other medications will try to target cell adhesion molecules used by platelets. So those are some two real world medical applications of being able to understand cell adhesion molecules, their role in different things, and then being able to develop medication to prevent or support or whatever it may be to, to help treat a specific illness or disease. One last thing I want to cover under, under the, the umbrella of, of talking about um, cellular functions, I want to talk about immunoglobulins. Uh, the immune system um, is very complex and it's made out of many types of cells and proteins and these cells and proteins they have a common purpose usually to get rid of the body uh, to get rid the to to rid the body of foreign invaders now the most prominent type of protein that's found in the immune system is the antibody antibodies are also called immunoglobulins, they are, are, they are proteins that are produced by um, B cells that are gonna function to neutralize targets in the body. So this word is just you know, a synonym to antibody, right? Antibodies are also referred to as um, immunoglobins. And like we said, they function to neutralize targets in the body, things like toxins and bacteria that shouldn't be there. They also function then to recruit other cells to help eliminate the threat. Uh, the threat. Now what we have here is, is the structure of a antibody. Antibodies are usually kind of Y-shaped, right? Um, uh, that are made out of these two identical heavy chains, all right, and two of these lighter chains, two identical lighter change, uh, chains. Then we have these disulfide links and non-covalent interactions that are gonna hold the light and heavy chains together. Um, and each antibody, it has an antigen binding region at the tips of the Y, all right, so right here. Within this region, there's gonna be specific polypeptide sequences that will bind one and only one specific um, antigenic sequence. The remaining part of the antibody molecule is then known as the constant region and it's involved in recruitment and binding of other cells of the immune system. Things like macrophages for example. So when antibodies bind to their targets called antigens, they can cause one of three outcomes. All right, one of three outcomes. They can, one, neutralize the antigen, making the, that pathogen or toxin unable to exert its effects on the body. It can, two, mark the pathogen for destruction by other white blood cells immediately, all right? And this marking function is, is also called opsonization. Or three, all right? They can cause clumping together of the antigen and antibody into large insoluble protein complexes that can be digested by macrophages. All right, and so that's kind of a brief overview of cellular functions for for proteins um, besides just enzymatic functions. Right, so we've kind of covered a good portion of this non-enzymatic protein function goal of of this chapter. Right, we've talked about structural proteins motor proteins, binding proteins, cell adhesion molecules, and even antibodies.
Now, one thing I want to talk about before we get into the second main objective of this chapter, which is talking about protein analysis, I want to talk a little bit about biosignaling. Biosignaling is a process in which cells receive and act on signals. Proteins participate in biosignaling in different capacities, including acting as extracellular, uh, extracellular ligands or transporters for facilitated diffusion or receptor proteins and, and as second messengers, right? The proteins involved in biosignaling can have functions in either substrate binding or even enzymatic activity. Now, some things under this umbrella of biosignaling that we want to cover are things like ion channels, um, enzyme-linked receptors, and G-protein coupled receptors, right? Because biosignaling can take advantage of, of either existing gradients, which would refer to ion channel, channels, or it can take advantage of second messenger cascades, which would fall under the guise of enzyme-linked receptors and, and G-protein coupled receptors. So that's why we want to cover these th three things. We'll start with first, ion channels. Ion channels are proteins that create specific pathways for charged molecules. All right, they are classified into three main groups that have different mechanisms of opening, but that all permit facilitated diffusion of charged particles. All right, if you remember, facilitated, facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport. It's the diffusion of molecules down a concentration gradient through a pore in the membrane that's created by some transmembrane protein. It's used for molecules that are pretty much impermeable to the membrane. All right, so think, you know, back to a couple chapters ago, that would be, you know, molecules that are large, polar, or uncharged. Now, facilitated diffusion allows integral pro, uh, membrane proteins to kind of serve as channels for these substrates so that they can avoid the hydrophobic fatty acid tails of the phospholipid bilayer. The three main types of ion channels that you should know for the MCAT are ungated, voltage gated, and ligand gated. All right? So in ungated, all right, as the name suggests, they have no gates and they're therefore unregulated. All right? For example, all cells possess ungated potassium channels. That means there's going to be a net. Um, um, a flux of potassium ions um, through these channels unless potassium is at equilibrium, all right? Then we have voltage-gated channels. This gate is regulated by the membrane potential change near the channel. So for example, many excitable cells like neurons, they possess voltage-gated sodium channels. Those channels are closed under resting conditions but membrane depolarization can cause a protein conformation change that will then allow them to quickly open and then close as that voltage increases. All right. Then there's also ligand gated channels. All right. For these, the binding of a, subs uh, of a specific substance or ligand to the channel is going to cause it to either open or close. For example, neurotransmitters are going to act at ligand gated channels at the postsynaptic membrane, all right? So that is going to be important for allowing in, uh, for the activity of, of neurotransmitters, all right? So that's ion channeling, that's ion channels, all right? We can also talk about enzyme-linked receptors. So many, you know, membrane receptors, they, they can also display catalytic activity in response to ligand binding. These enzyme-linked receptors, they kind of have three primary protein domains. They have a membrane span, spanning domain, they have a ligand binding domain, and they have a catalytic domain. So the membrane spanning domain, it's gonna anchor the receptor in the cell membrane. The ligand binding domain is going to be stimulated by the appropriate ligand, and that is going to induce a conformational change that will then activate the catalytic domain. All right, this often results in the initiation of some second messenger cascade. And a good example of this is receptor tyrosine kinases. All right, 
these are composed of a monomer that di uh, dimerizes upon ligand binding. Fantastic. All right. Then there's also G protein coupled receptors. G protein coupled receptors, uh, they are a large family of integral membrane proteins involved in signal transduction. Now, in, they're, they're usually characterized by their seven membrane spanning alpha helices. They, the receptors differ in specificity of the lichen binding area. Um, found on that extracellular surface of the cell. And in order for these G protein coupled receptors to transmit signals to an effector in the cell, they utilize a heterotrimeric G protein. G proteins are named for their intracellular ring link to guanine nucleotides, so GDP and GTP. And the binding of a ligand is gonna increase the affinity of the receptor for the G protein. Now, there are three main types of G proteins you should know, okay? We have GS, which stimulates the adenylate uh, cyclase. It's gonna increase levels of CAMP in the cell. All right, then you have G1, which inhibits um, adenylate cyclase, and that's gonna decrease levels of CAMP in the cell. So this one increases CMP levels, this one decreases CMP. CAMP levels. And then our third type is GQ. GQ activates phospholipase C, which cleaves a phospholipid from the membrane to form PIP2. So this one forms PIP2. PIP2 um, can then be cleaved further into um, other molecules like DAG and IP3. And IP3 specifically can open calcium channels in the endoplasmic reticulum, thereby increasing calcium levels in the cell. So these are the three G proteins you should probably be familiar with and their effects. Fantastic. Now what we can move into is protein isolation. In order to better understand a specific protein, it's gonna be important to be able to isolate the protein for study. The purification of proteins can be pretty much considered an art form um, when you consider the difficulty of, of, of doing purification of proteins um, and the difficulty of isolating just one protein from a cell containing hundreds to thousands of them. Now, the most common isolation techniques and the ones that we have to worry about for the MCAT um, are electrophoresis and chromatography, either of which can be used for native or denatured proteins. We'll first talk about electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is, like we said, one method of separating proteins. Um, it works by subjecting compounds to an electric field, which moves, um, which moves those compounds according to their net charge and size. So negatively charged compounds will migrate towards the positively charged electroid. So negatively charged compounds will move towards that positive side. Positively charged um, compounds will want to stay closer to the negative electrode. All right. So negatively charged compounds will migrate toward the positively charged anoid and positively charged compounds are going to migrate towards the negatively charged anoid. Now this, the velocity of this migration is known as the migration velocity, and we can actually write the, the migration velocity as an equation. All right. Where V is directly proportional to the electric field strength, all right, and to the net charge of the molecule, which I we're going to denote as Z. So E is electric field, electric field Z is charge, all right, and it's inversely proportional to the frictional coefficient, which we uh, denote F. And this depends on the mass and the shape of the migrating molecules. So now we have this equation for migration velocity that's directly proportional to electric field and charge, inversely proportional to friction coefficient. Now, the standard medium for protein electrophoresis is a polyacrylamide uh, gel. Um, this gel is going to be slightly porous. It's a porous matrix mixture. Um, and proteins travel th through this matrix in relation, obviously, to their size and charge. The gel kind of acts like a sieve that allows 
smaller particles to pass through easily while kind of retaining large particles. So it's not just charge that will affect, remember, uh, migration and migration velocity and direction, but also size. Okay, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. A molecule will move faster through the medium if it's smaller, highly charged, or placed in a large electric field. And conversely, molecules will migrate slower or not at all when they are bigger, more convoluted, electrically neutral, neutral or placed in a very small electric field. Now, there are different kinds of variations of electrophoresis that we're going to talk about and compare and contrast. That's going to be native page and SDS page. Native page um, is, is this, all right? So polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis page is a method for analyzing proteins in their native states. So that's what native page is. Unfortunately, page is limited by the varying mass to charge and the mass to size ratios of cellular proteins because multiple different proteins may experience the same level of migration. So in this native page electrophoresis, the functional native protein, it can be recovered from the gel after electrophoresis, but only if the gel hasn't been stained because most stains will denature proteins. Page is most useful to compare the molecular size or the charge of proteins known to be similar in size. Um, but if that's not the case, another useful technique is the SDS page method. So SDS stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, this polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is, is a useful tool because it separates proteins on the basis of mass alone. So this technique starts with the premise of page, but then it adds SDS, which is a, dis which is a detergent that will disrupt all non-covalent interactions. It binds to proteins and it creates large chains with negative, net negative charges. And so it neutralizes the protein's original charge and denatures the protein. And so then as the protein moves through the, uh, the gel, the only variable that's affecting their velocity is going to be the electric field strength and the frictional coefficient, which depends on mass. So this is a good technique if you're only really interested in, um, you know, it, it is useful when you're only separating proteins on the basis of mass alone. Now, something to also keep in mind when you're talking about electrophoresis is that proteins can be separated on the basis of their isoelectric point, all right, PI. And we've talked about this before, too. The PI is the pH at which the protein or amino acid is electrically neutral. With, so that means within, that it has an equal number of positive and negative charges. For individual amino acids, this electrically neutral form is called the Zwitter ion, if you remember. Um, and that is when the amino group is protonated, the carboxyl group is deprotonated, and the side chain is electrically neutral. Isoelectric focusing exploits the acidic and basic properties of amino acids by separating on the basis of that isoelectric point, PI. So in short, isoelectric focusing, in, in isoelectric focusing, a protein will stop moving when the pH is equal to the pi. All right, fantastic. So that's electrophoresis. Something else that we want to talk about when we talk about um, protein analysis, protein separation, um, is chromatography. Chromatography is another tool that will use physical and chemical properties to separate and identify compounds from a complex mixture. It refers to a variety of techniques that are gonna require the homogenized protein mixture to be fractionated, uh, to be fractionated through a porous matrix. Um, one of the reasons that this is a valuable tool is that the isolated protein is pretty much immediately available for identification and quantification, all right? Now, the, the couple of chromatography techniques we're going to talk about here um, are all of these forms that we're going to talk about. The concept is identical. The more similar the compound is to the surroundings, whether that's by polarity, charge, so on, the more it will stick to and move slowly through its surroundings. So remember that. This is very important. The more similar the compound is to its surroundings, 
the more it will stick to its surrounding, and that means the more slowly it will work through the surrounding. All right. Chromatography is preferred over electrophoresis when you have large amounts of proteins that are being separated. And, and the process begins by placing the sample into a, it begins by placing the sample into a solid medium called the stationary phase that's filled up in your little chromatography column, all right, or the absorbent. The next step is after you run the sample through this is to run the mobile phase through the stationary phase. This is going to allow the sample to run through the stationary phase or a loop. And then depending on the relative affinity of that sample for the stationary and mobile phase, different substances will obviously migrate through this column at different speeds. All right. And that means you're going to be able to separate the different components in your sample. All right. Components that have high affinity for the stationary phase will barely migrate at all. Components with high affinity for the mobile phase will obviously move much more quickly. All right. The amount of time that a compound can, pro uh, can spend in the stationary phase is referred to as the retention time. Varying retention times of each co compound in the solution is going to result in separation of components within the stationary phase or departitioning or, or partitioning all right so that means each component can be isolated individually for study and the only thing that you're thinking about is how fast each component will separate depending on if it's more attracted or similar to your stationary phase versus your mobile phase all right so you're thinking in terms of your stationary station oops phase versus your mobile phase all right usually if you have a column you pack it with like silica that's your stationary phase and then you pass through it some sort of liquid solvent that's your mobile phase if the sample that's passed through here is like your stationary phase then it's going to move slowly if it's like your mobile phase it will move more quickly all right, and then based off of that, you'll separate the different components of your sample um, as, as, you, as it passes through the column. Now we're gonna talk about a couple of different kinds of chromatography. We'll talk about column chromatography, all right? In column chromatography, this is what I just displayed here. A column is filled with silica or, or aluminum beads as an absorbent, and gravity moves the solvent and compounds down the column. As the solution flows through that column, both size and polarity are going to have a role in determining how quickly a compound moves through the polar silica or alumina beads. The less polar the compound, the faster it can elute through the column. So that means it's going to have a short retention time. All right. In column chromatography, the solvent polarity, pH, or salinity can easily be changed to help elute the protein of interest. And eventually, the solvent, the solvent will drip out of the end of the column and different fractions that leave the column are going to be collected over time. All right. I know I used column chromatography to, to convey this idea right here, which we discussed earlier. Uh, but you have to remember that in column chromatography, there are several things that are going to affect how fast something moves through said column. Things like solvent polarity, pH, salinity, all those things are going to have a role. All right, so that's one kind of chromatography, column chromatography. Then we have ion exchange chromatography. So in this method, the beads in the column are going to be charged, are, are going to be coated with charged substances. So they will attract or bind compounds that have opposite charge. So for instance, a positively charged, so if you have a column, all right, and you have these beads, all right, and you have a uh, a positively charged column bead, right? Column beads. They're going to attract and try to hold on to negative proteins, all right, as it passes through the column. So that's one way of holding. So, so what this means is if you have a positively charged um, coated substance, right? If, you, if the beads in the column are coated with a positive, uh, char positively charged substance, and it's going to bind to your to negatively charged proteins. That means your positive proteins are going to move much faster, and they're going to be eluded first. They're going to be uh, they're going to come out first from your column, and then 
in comparison to those negatively charged proteins, which are being bound to your positively charged um, coated column. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Then you have size exclusion. Um, chromatography, in this method, the beads that are used in the column are gonna contain tiny pores of varying sizes, and these tiny pores are gonna allow small compounds to enter the beads, and that's gonna slow them down. So the larger compounds that can't fit into the pores, they're gonna move and travel through the column faster than the smaller um, compounds that will fit into the pores of the beads and, and kind of stay there for longer. So that's three types of chromatography that we've talked about, column chromatography, ion exchange, and size exclusion. One more thing in the realm of protein analysis and protein separation that we wanna talk about is x-ray crystallography and NMR. So separating from separating proteins from one another is generally only the first step in analysis. The next step is to then study that isolated protein. Protein function, structure, or quantity is often of high interest to researchers, right? Especially if they're spe studying a specific protein that they want to learn everything about. Even after protein separation, and even after protein identification, protein analysis tools can be used to study that protein further. Now, protein structure specifically, it can be determined through things like X-ray crystallography and also NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Now, before crystallographic analysis, though, that protein has to be isolated and it has to be crystallized. X-ray crystallography, though, is the most reliable and common method for that. 75% of the protein structures that are known today were actually analyzed through this method. And essentially, crystallography measures electron density on an extremely high-resolution scale. It can also be used, in addition, on nucleic acids. An X-ray diffraction pattern is generated using this method. All right, something that's gonna look like this, some diffraction pattern. The small dots in the diffraction pattern can then be interpreted to determine the protein structure. You don't necessarily need to know how it, this exactly works because it's very complicated, but you should know that X-ray crystallography is one of the most commonly used methods to determine protein structure. And what you get from X-ray crystallography is an X-ray diffraction pattern that allows you to determine the protein structure from. You don't need to know how that works. That is complicated, just that it does work. All right. And with that, we end our review of this chapter. Next video, we'll do some practice problems. And that's it. You're prepared for the MCAT biochemistry section. Let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns down below. Other than that, good luck, happy studying, and have a beautiful, beautiful day, future doctors.